On this episode of Uncommon Sense, Joseph Pierce is back on the show. We talk with him about all things Tolkien. That's all coming up on Uncommon Sense. A warm welcome to all of the listeners. Thank you so much for tuning in to Uncommon Sense, the official podcast of the Society of G.K. Chesterton. I am Albert Sines, joined with my wonderful co-host, Gretelyn Darkey. Gretelyn, hello, good day, greetings. Hi there. And as I mentioned in the introduction, we have the pleasure once again of being joined by Joseph Pierce. Joseph, a very good morning to you. Good morning, top of the morning to you. You know, I uh, I wish I had some sort of uh, Elvish greeting for you, uh, <laughs> but unfortunately, I'm a little I'm a little rough on my Elvish. Well, I'm I'm, I'm better with Shire talk, quite frankly, than I am with <laughs> Elvish. Anyway, so it's just as well. Wonderful. Um, well, it's you know, Albert and I were we're thinking about getting someone on here to talk about Tolkien, and you seem like the obvious choice. Uh, a, a major producer of television is is putting out some kind of Tolkien travesty right now. Uh, but, you know, I, I haven't seen it. I refuse to see it. But it, it's a good excuse as any to talk about Tolkien again, um, one of our favorite authors here at the Chesterton Society. Uh, so um, do you want to just give us a, a little background for yourself and Tolkien, Joseph? Yes. Well, uh, I am... Um wrote a book back in the late 1990s when I was still living in England called Tolkien Man and Myth. And that was written uh, as a reaction against the negative reaction of this self-styled literati to the emergence of Tolkien as the most popular author of the 20th century, according to several nationwide polls. Uh, and it was clear to me that these, um, these pompous, uh, presumptuous individuals had never even read the work, uh, but did, did not feel that their ignorance precluded them their having any right to pass judgment. So um, I, um, I, I wrote a uh, Tolkien Man and Myth, which was um, a literary life. So it's a biography of Tolkien, but also contains two or three chapters on the deep Christian significance of uh, the Silmarillion and the, the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings. And then subsequently, after I moved to the States, I wrote two other books on Tolkien, uh, Bilbo's Journey, Discovering the Hidden Meaning of the Hobbit, and Frodo's Journey, Discovering the Hidden Meaning of the Lord of the Rings. So I've now uh, been engaging with Tolkien for, for a quarter of a century. Beautiful. And uh, when it, just for a little personal touch, how did you personally find Tolkien? Well, that, uh, that's always a good question, but it's, it's one that elicits uh, an unusual reply because I did not read Tolkien until I was an adult, a young adult in my early 20s. And I first read The Lord of the Rings during my second prison sentence. Um, so I suppose we should probably explain, <laughs> explain that. Um, so I, I, I wrote another book called Race with the Devil, My Journey from Racial Hatred to Rational Love, um, in which I, I, I chart my journey from uh, white, supremacy, white supremacism and my involvement in neo-Nazi organization in England and my going to prison twice for publishing material deemed likely to incite racial hatred and my journey by the grace of God and largely under the influence of G.K. Chesterton uh, to, to the Catholic Church. So I was on that path. Uh, during this second prison sentence, I'd been reading Chesterton already, which is why I, I, you know, I, I was thinking, why am I here? I don't even believe this stuff anymore. Um, so the second prison sentence was much more difficult for me to cope with than the first, because the first I was just a fanatic. Um, but it was during that prison sentence, I'd been putting off reading The Lord of the Rings for so long, because it's sort of, you know, a thousand words, a thousand pages. Uh, and I thought, you know, I, I'd like to read it, I should read it, but I don't have time to read it. And then you find yourself in a prison cell with all the time, uh, on, on more time than you want on your hands. And so this was a perfect time to read it. So I, that's when I first read it and uh, didn't get all of the Christian dimension at the time. And I wasn't a, a fully fleshed Christian myself. So, of course, the deeper Catholic significance that Tolkien said of The Lord of the Rings, it is, of course, a fundamentally religious and Catholic work. And that deeper significance largely passed me by in that first reading but I became more aware of it uh you know with my repeated engagement with the, with the text and that's what prompted me to write that book uh in 1998 uh, 1997 I think which was eight years after my reception to the church wonderful 
Um, I, I think though, I'm a bit, you know, I'm a bit of an Anglophile. Uh, and I think that most people, American, English, whatever, would, would see even from Lord of the Rings, even without noticing the spiritual aspects that it is kind of in a strange way, the, the English epic, the modern English epic, um, even though it's technically a fantasy, it's steeped in, in England in every way. Yes. In actual fact, Tolkien said that his, his, um, intention, his hope was to actually to create an epic for his own people, for, for the English people. And it's certainly true that the Lord of the Rings is, is, is not a novel. It ha actually has much more in common with the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Aeneid, Beowulf, uh, and, and these uh, epic sagas from the past than it has with the modern novel. So it, it, to call it an epic is, is absolutely correct. I have a question Joseph, you've already talked about how, as you discovered it, you know, you sort of eventually came across the sort of Christian undertones that were present in The Lord of the Rings. And I'm curious, was Tolkien setting, setting out to actually purposely make it a sort of, you know, metaphor for Christianity? Or was it just that his sort of own his own belief sort of trickled into the story. Because I think you, you could look at the Chronicles of Narnia and what Lewis was doing, especially like in The Lion, the Witch of the Wardrobe, and, you know, Aslan is killed and he's resurrected. It's very obvious there that what, what Lewis was doing. Was, was Tolkien setting out to be that uh, explicit in the Christian meaning, or is it just that you can relate to it because Tolkien was a Christian himself? Well, it's not either or, but both and. And, and uh, again, Tolkien's own words, if I'm going to continue that sentence I quoted earlier, it, 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 will, it will illustrate the Tolkien's modus operandi uh, in, in the writing of, of, of the book. He said, the Lord of the Rings is, of course, a fundamentally religious and Catholic work, unconsciously at first, consciously in the revision. So, so obviously the story flowed out of him just as a good story containing, subsumed within it, the Christian ethos, which Tolkien had believed you know, the whole of his life. He was a lifelong practicing Catholic. So that's, that's there subsumed within the fabric of the ethical philosophy, if you like, that, 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 that underpins the story. But there are also specific elements added uh, that, that, that deepen uh, and explicate uh, a Catholic theology, and the most important of which is the date on which the ring is destroyed, which is March the 25th. And March the 25th, of course, is the most significant date on the Christian calendar because March the 25th is the Feast of the Annunciation. And of course, we as Catholics know that life does not begin at birth, but it begins at conception. Human life begins at conception. So the God became man, the word became flesh on March the 25th, not December the 25th. So the Feast of Annunciation is hugely uh, 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 significant as the Feast of the Incarnation. But more than that, Tolkien was a medievalist and he knew that the early church and those in the, in, in, in the, in the Middle Ages uh, uh, also believed that the historical date of the crucifixion was March the 25th. Now, we don't assign a specific date to the crucifixion because uh, Good Friday is celebrated as a movable feast. But of course, the event historically, Christ's crucifixion happened on one particular date in history, and the early church believed that was March the 25th. So if March the 25th is the feast of both the incarnation and the crucifixion, which taken together the resurrection is our redemption, then we actually see that the fact that Tolkien has the ring destroyed on this date is the connection we need to make theologically to plumb the real depths. So basically, to cut a long story short, to cut to the chase, you know that um, original sin, the power of original sin is destroyed by the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ on March the 25th. Um, and uh, the, the original sin is the one sin to rule them all and in the darkness bind them. And the one ring to rule them all in the darkness bind them. And the one sin to rule them all and in the darkness bind them are both destroyed in the same significant date connecting them. Beautiful. That's, that's amazing. I just got chills. <laughs> I have to mark March 25th on my calendar. <laughs> it's extra special now um no that that's that's really cool um and and i love that that there's a there was enough attention to detail there that tolkien put that in um probably in revision but still there there's a recognition there that this was a significant sort of mirror of the 
uh, the incarnation and the redemption of the world. And, and Tol Tolkien is actually following his his mentors. I mean, Tolkien was a, you know, a medievalist, and you find in medieval literature such as Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, which um, which um, Tolkien translated, and in the Divine Comedy, the 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 the, 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 the action is set against the backdrop of the liturgical year. So in the Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, it's an entire year, Christmas to Christmas, um, and in the Dante's Divine Comedy, Dante descends into hell on Holy Thursday and doesn't emerge into Mount Purgatory until the morning of, of Easter Sunday. So Tolkien is just and and same things done in Chaucer. Chaucer has the nun's priest tale. Uh, take place on April Fool's Day, um, so you know this is something which the uh, which the medievals did. So putting a, a, a hugely significant allegorical date to to point to deeper theological significance is something Tolkien's following in very noble medieval footsteps in doing so. And yet, some of the the genius I think of Tolkien is that he has these spectacular larger than life figures like Gandalf like uh Strider um but and then he has the hobbits and the hobbits are kind of the indication that well you know anyone can be holy anyone can follow this path uh the hobbits are the most humble <laughs> stay at home you know just normal people in in the world and yet Frodo is pulled on this journey Sam comes with him um and and again it's almost by this sort of strange kind of grace of, of, um, of sparing uh, Gollum that they're able to destroy the ring at all. Uh, it's, it's just a beautifully, a beautifully crafted story with a wonderfully, a wonderful element of, of relatability that I think brings it um, really from, from just an epic to a, a modern epic uh, that we, that is relatable to modern people as much as you want to, you want to just say that it's only timeless. I think it's both. I think it's timeless and it's also, completely uh i don't know i relate to the hobbits <laughs> well anything that is time anything that is timeless is ipso facto timely you know because if, if something is timeless it never goes out of fashion never goes out of date it's perennially relevant and of course the the, the, the the reason that the hobbits are those that have the paradoxical power to destroy the ring is that the ring being a signifier of sin is 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 um connected inseparably from the sin of pride the first and worst of sins. Well, the antidote to that poison is humility. So, you know, with, with the hobbits, uh, as the smallest of people that Samuel doesn't even know exists because the pride don't care about the little folk, uh, we see the exaltation of the humble. And that I think that's the spirit of, of, of the Christian spirit, Lord of the Rings. It is the exaltation of the humble and the defeat of pride by humility. Beautiful. And you even have sort of the, the section at the end where the hobbits come back and have to defend the Shire. And it's kind of, you know, a prophet is without honor, is not without honor except in his native place. Because <laughs> they come home and nobody is, is aware of what they've done or, you know, they just have to come home and be normal people again. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a, it certainly has a, a sort of Marian Magnificat uh, echo there. Amen. You know, um, I don't want to veer too far off from the main topic, but obviously this is a Chesterton-based podcast, so I've got to find some place to slip the, the, the intellectual giant in here. In your opinion, because it's probably just an opinion question, Joseph, where would you say that Chesterton, if at, if at any place, because maybe there is no place, that he's sort of, his sort of influence potentially is prominent or you can sort of see in the storyline of what Tolkien created in The Lord of the Rings. Like you would say, oh yeah, that's something that Chesterton would have completely approved of. That, that would have been something that Chesterton would have written himself. Does that make sense, the question? Yes, I think the best way of approaching it is to acknowledge uh right up front that, that Chesterton was a significant influence on Tolkien. Bear in mind that Tolkien was born in 1892. Chesterton was first published in 1900 and was probably at his most uh, popular uh, between 1900 and the beginning of World War One. So that means that basically that, 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 um, uh, that Chesterton is most popular from when Tolkien's eight to when Tolkien's 22. In other words, his formative years. Tolkien as a young practicing Catholic would have seen in, in Chesterton an ally. The Catholics were amongst the, uh, Chesterton's greatest advocates, even though Chesterton technically 
was not a Catholic. But of course, from orthodoxy onwards in 1908, when Tolkien would have been 16, uh, you know, that, that Chesterton is, is the great defender of, of, of Christian orthodoxy. We also know that, that Tolkien is a young man read uh, The Ballad of the White Horse, and this was a very formative influence upon him. And of course, The Ballad of the White Horse is the nearest Chesterton gets to writing an epic. Uh, it's called a ballad, but in some sense it does have this epic feel about it. King Alfred's, you know, efforts to to free the, pe the Christian people of England from the pagan menace. Um, so and the appearance of the mother of God, etc., etc. So um, the, the Tolkien was very influenced by uh, by Chesterton. And we can see particularly in, in, in Tolkien uh, and C.S. Lewis, the, the influence of the chapter in Orthodoxy called um, The Ethics of Elfland. And this informed Tolkien's and Lewis's philosophy of myth, the way they understood that you can come to a love of wisdom through the power of story. Um, and so Chesterton was a, was a, was a, a, a huge influence on, on Tolkien. And in that sense, we can see a Chestertonian shadow uh, over Middle Earth. Or should, maybe you should say should, Chestertonian light. <laughs> Can't talk about shadows over the middle of <laughs> Lovely. Um, wonderful. Yeah, and I, I had heard too that, I don't know how much of this is myth, but that Tolkien had read The Ballad of the White Horse while he was in the trenches in World War I. Um, I don't know how true that is, but uh, it is significant, I think, that um, – you have so much literature coming out of World War One and World War Two that was so dark and twisted and sad and broken. Um, and then you have The Lord of the Rings, which clearly has some influence from uh, from Tolkien's experience in the war. Uh, you can, if you know anything about any of the, especially the French battlefields, the horrors that happened there, um, you can see it in places like the Dead Marshes and some of the battle scenes. Um and and it's it's amazing though that he he could come out of it with this beautiful story that is so redemptive even with all the darkness in it. Yeah, so we certainly do see the shadow of World War One casting its way across the length of the story, particularly in places such as the Dead Marshes, which evokes the horror of what. Tolkien called the animal horror of the Somme. He actually fought in the Battle of the Somme, probably the bloodiest and most gory and gruesome battle of the whole of World War One. He was there. So he he saw things that, 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 that we can't even imagine. Um, and uh, so that darkness is present. But there's the light of God, you know, was never eclipsed in Tolkien's life. And what he sees in, in, in the evil of war is the evil of man. Um, and you know that if 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 we will if we will be our own gods, we are condemning ourselves to just to repeat ad nauseum uh, this cycle of warfare, which has beset human history, a product of pride, a man's own self deification. So we so we see that you know T Tolkien has a a good Catholic understanding of uh, of 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 just war theory that you that we we not not only can but we should resist. By whatever force is necessary, uh, the forces of evil. But war is itself a consequence of sin, um, and you know the, the fact that we have to respond to sin by trying to protect virtue uh, and, and fight for the for, for the cause of love um, does not negate the fact that evil the war is itself an evil. Mm. Yeah. Um, and then there's obviously, too, the, the very obvious element of industrial warfare that uh, Tolkien weaves into his story. Um, and, and that is perhaps another area where, uh, to, <laughs> to throw, throw you a bone, Albert, where um, Chesterton's influence is, is strong. Uh, because Tolkien definitely had a reaction of, you know, nature over in the industrial sort of wasteland. Um, and that is a very Chestertonian ideal as well. Yes, I mean basically that you know that there's a, there's a word that's, that's that, that I, I I'm I'm beginning to start using of myself much more often because I'm got to the stage in my life where I don't care what people think of me. Um, but there's there, 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 there's a word that that's normally used in a derogatory fashion. That's the word luddite, and and the luddites were the people at the time of the industrial revolution that went around breaking up 
factory machinery because it was putting them out of out of work. And so a Luddite is seen as someone who's you know destructive of progress and what have you. But uh, I think we start need to start questioning whether um, the industrialization of the world uh, or, and and the great war of the machines, which is the consequence uh, as, as Tolkien dubbed World War II, uh, is is necessarily a good thing. And whether perhaps you know we would be better getting back to a simpler way of understanding reality and living more closely with uh, creation, with God's creation, and not trying to usurp the goodness, truth, and beauty of creation with uh, with means uh, of self empowerment that also becomes me- become means of self destruction. I guess it's time to build some more shires in the world, and uh, really. Yeah, and I say that sort of you know lightheartedly, but I think really you see a small section of the populace which has started to realize that the influence of industry, the influence of technology, the influence of what we could call modern man, has started to have some very negative repercussions on really everything, you know, we could say the earth as a whole, that's fairly obvious, but I think just on who we are, on on humanity, and it would sort of behoove us to find a way. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not actually advocating that every single person in the earth has to go barefoot and uh, start making their own cheese in some green pasture that looks like something out of a fantasy. But just to realize that a simplification of our lives could go a very long way and impacting us in in very good ways uh, versus sort of the direction that we're headed now. And we're seeing that there's a lot of negative uh, impacts from, you know, what we've done as far as saying, oh, well, these are just advances in technology. We're just, we're just following the, the trends of time. Like, yeah, but are you looking at what it's doing to us? So I, I think uh, a Shire mentality may not be a terrible thing for people to to consider. Well, the the key thing is you asked about Chestertonian influence, and the fact is that the Shire is distributist. If you you want to see a Chestertonian uh, connection or Chestertonian influence, quite clearly Tolkien uh, is an adherent to the Chester Bellocian uh, understanding of economics and politics, which is known as distributism. Um, the, the Shire is a distributist, distributist society, and what the scouring of the Shire of the end is uh, is the um, the fight by these distributists against, first of all, the industrialism that had crept in under the influence of Mordor, uh, and the socialism that was a consequence in the industrialism. So it's a fight both against industrialism and socialism, uh, which is successful. Now, the hobbits take up arms uh, in order to scour the Shire to restore it to a healthier uh, way of life. And we should say one thing here, by the way, that, you know, that Mordor is globalist, right? It's the one that the one ring to rule them all in the darkness find them. You know, is the one size to fit them all, and in the and in the in the darkness, by them. That one size being Mordor size, being giant size, being globalist sized, and and the way you fight against that globalism is by the resurrection of shires all over the place, and that can be done in all sorts of ways. I mean, just by um, the, the starting. Uh, local craft breweries and then actually uh, spending your money on on good ale and not and not on uh, mass-produced uh, chemical fears that masquerades as beer you know <laughs> and, and local cheese we, we buy most of our meat from the local farmers uh, market we buy most of our produce from the local farmers market as far as possible we try to opt out of globalism and opt into localism so that's that's living if you like in the shire as far as possible within the modern world it's a practical option it's not merely utopian yeah and i think um you know and it's funny that there's so many there's there seems to be a large secular trend that's coming back to this it's it's a very natural feeling uh you don't even have to have the religious aspect uh to know that this is something that that feels better that that is better for our bodies and our minds and our souls and uh it it brings us back to community it brings us back to family can I can I say something here just just to be to be really um an extreme luddite just for the fun of it because I, I, you know, I, I think Albert says something about you know I'm not you're not suggesting that you know we should stop wearing shoes. Well, we should remind ourselves hobbits didn't wear shoes. And 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 there was um there was a wonderful line in a poem by Gerard Manny Hopkins, a poem called uh, I think God's Grandeur, where the line is 
nor can foot feel being shod. In other words, we can't feel the beauty of the lush grass under our feet because we've got shoes on. Now, I'm not saying we should all take our shoes off and live like, like hippies or hobbits. Uh, certainly, if I, if I have to do one or the other, I, I prefer the latter. Um, but, but if we do, what, what, what the shoes symbolize in that line is accretions of artificiality between us and reality. You know, Tolkien says somewhere, you know, disparagingly and satirically, or oh, how real is a factory chimney compared with an elm tree? You know, ultimately, mm -hmm. we, we can survive without the factory chimney. We can't survive without trees and grass and vegetation and that which actually gives us sustenance. And uh, take your shoes off and step on the grass and see how that feels versus stepping on the asphalt. <laughs> Amen. Uh, Joseph, we're we're coming closer to the end of the podcast here, but I'd love to just sort of uh, turn it to sort of your own personal uh, uh, your personal love here. Just focusing on the the world that Tolkien created in the Lord of the Rings. We have the Hobbit. We have the uh, the Lord of the Rings, we have the Cimmerillion. There it was a lot of sort of a lot of time that he spent creating this world. And just out of sheer curiosity, I'm wondering for you, what is your favorite part that Tolkien cre created? Is it a is it one of the one of the books? Is it a particular uh, storyline within the Lord of the Rings? Just what what is it that you enjoy the most? That always is something that you're, I love reading this. Well, uh, I, I'm going to allude to one of my favorite works by Tolkien, and that's that's a, a short story called Leaf by Niggle. Uh, and, and, and in this work by Tolkien, which is a favorite of mine, I, that, that be, that, it's my partial answer. I, I do love that. It's an autobiographical story about the role of Tolkien as an artist, as in a writer, but also the role of any artist. So the character Niggle is both an autobiographical Tolkien figure, but also an everyman figure. Um, and in that, the, 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 the painter is trying to bring a huge landscape into being, but only manages to bring to perfection or to his satisfaction, or say not perfection, to his satisfaction, you know, one tree and, and certain leaves on that one tree. Um, that tree or that leaf, that part of the landscape which was brought to perfection is the Lord of the Rings. Uh, that's Tolkien's finished work. Um, you know, obviously the Hobbit's a finished work, but that was for children. You now the, the Lord of the Rings is his epic finished magnum opus. So that's where we should look for the best of Tolkien. Uh, other works are, are unfinished and fragmented, like the portrait around the edge. But so Lord of the Rings is definitely the, 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 the best and therefore, actually, my favourite. But Leaf by Niggle, if you want to understand Tolkien's philosophy, read Leaf by Niggle. If you want to understand his, his philosophy expressed in beautiful poetry, one of the greatest poems of the 20th century, read his poem Mythopoeia. Uh, and, um, and, and finally, if you really want to see Tolkien's theology at its deepest and best, read the Ainul Indala, the opening chapter of the Sun if you, if you do If you do those things, you've got the best of Tolkien. Wonderful, really wonderful, um, and it's it speaks to the fact too that Tolkien, you know, he has that one masterpiece. Really, he doesn't have a ton of things. We have Chesterton wrote many, 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 many things, and they're all wonderful. But I think you could argue that Chesterton doesn't really have, in the same way, one huge masterpiece. He has many very beautiful things, but it's just not the same. Uh, so it's it's kind of interesting that the different sorts of art that we have. Um, and in Tolkien, it's definitely the one extremely beautiful tree. <laughs> Joseph, can you help our listeners out if they wanted to uh, pick up any of the books that you uh, wrote about Tolkien, The Lord of the Rings, where could they get those books? Well, first of all, I would say that if anybody wants to keep up with what I'm up to, what I'm writing, uh, what I'm doing, what I'm thinking, uh, they should they should go to my personal website, which is jpearce.co, J-P-E-A-R-C-E dot C-O. As for the Tolkien books, um, ignatius.com for Tolkien Man and Myth and tanbooks.com for Frodo's Journey and Bilbo's Journey. And we will include those links in the description, but I wanted you to hear it from the man himself. So if you are interested in any of those works or uh, finding out what tea Joseph is drinking, of course, you can go to his website. Um, I don't know if he gives that much detail. That was just because 
he is a he is an avid tea drinker. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you have been listening to Uncommon Sense. We've had the extreme pleasure of talking with Joseph Pierce, who has been giving us his insight into the life and world of Tolkien. And we're so glad for his time. Joseph, thank you so much for being with us on the show. My pleasure as always. Thanks for having me. And Grelin, always thank you so much for joining us and being on our own adventure on this episode. Thank you. Thank you, Albert. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we hope that you have enjoyed uh, being with us on this episode of Uncommon Sense. I encourage you to continue to follow us. We will continue on our journey where we follow Chesterton and all things related to Chesterton. And remember, Chesterton is always better with friends. Talk to you next time. Mm-hmm.